Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. Hey, lovers of small businesses and good stories in general. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 125 of Small Business War Stories. And today I had the opportunity to sit down with Silas Pollitt. And Silas is a really interesting guy. We met at uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu here in Austin. But he ended up <clears throat> moving to Vermont to start a pizza shop. And it's uh, he's a um, very, very good, uh, good chef. He has a lot of experience. We talk about that. We talk a lot about... Um, interesting aspects of what it means to start a food business and a restaurant. We talked about Anthony Bourdain. He's a big fan. I'm a big fan. Um, and, you know, we have the judicial connection, but also um, what the whole aspect of um, mental health in the restaurant business comes up in what it means to work in an environment where, you know, things are hot and sharp and uh, what it means as a business. I mean, notoriously, restaurants are very, very difficult businesses. And uh, I talked to Silas about what it's meant uh, for him to to have Stone's Throw Pizza. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Gusto. Gusto is a company that helps you, as a small business, deal with your payrolls, your benefits, your HR, all the things that are a pain to do for your business. Uh, and allows you to really focus on what you want to do and how to grow your business. You, as a listener, get three months for free once you run your first payroll. Go to gusto.com, G-U-S-T-O.com, slash war stories, W-A-R-S-T-O-R-I-E-S, war stories, and sign up. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode, number 125, with Silas Pollitt, of Stone's Throw Pizza. And we are live here. And we're doing a... We're, we're actually sitting here in Austin, Texas. First of all, cheers. It's great to see you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, there you go. I'm sitting here with Silas Pollitt, who is a chef and owner at Stone's Throw Pizza in Vermont. Very far north of Vermont, almost to Canada. right? But we're actually sitting here in Austin. We were uh, jiu-jitsu and still are jiu-jitsu teammates at uh, Gracie Humaita Academy. And, I'm uh, still salty from noon class right now. <laughs> it's awesome. But I would love to um, talk to you a little bit more. Uh, you moved away from Austin to start a restaurant. I did. Uh, before we actually start talking about that, I have a gift for you. Oh, wow. To thank you for bringing me on here. Okay. Um, what's, what's the gift? I brought something I thought that you and I would both enjoy, and I didn't know if I'd have a chance to pick anything up here, so I brought it with me. Okay. And you wow. probably already I have this. I'm very excited. I have no idea what this is. Oh my God, this is amazing. I have no, I absolutely 100% do not have this. It's awesome. It's this really, is good. Really awesome. So I'm holding in my hands here a Tom Waits vinyl record, and it's live from Austin, and it's uh, Romeo Bleeding. And this is a relatively young Tom Waits here. That, that was recorded 78 for an ACL show. Which still gets replayed pretty often because it's such a, like, a legendary recording. This is unbelievable. And that's when he's, wow. at, he's at full beat poet, like, smell like a brewery, look like a tramp, that kind of time. This is incredible. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how much you know that I collect records. Well, I, I assume you did. Which... Yeah. Yeah. This is, th- thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. This is This is really special. Yeah, if any future guests are listening to this, this is uh, this is really cool and highly encouraged. <laughs> yeah, and I brought that from my collection here, which is why it's kind of bent because I brought it in my backpack. Oh, this is perfect. Between oh. between pad between jujitsu geese. Wow, so what an honor! Thank you, thank you so so much. I'll definitely I'll definitely be playing this. Tom Waits is somebody who really. I have a couple of his records, uh, but he has a pretty extensive uh, catalog, and I know he's a, he's a great songwriter. So I'm you know yeah. excited to get more into him. Yeah, his sound is all over the place, but he's just a wacko who just does what he's supposed to do. Yeah, and that's, or that's aren't, beautiful. aren't we all in some way, right? Hey, that's what we should all aspire to be. Yeah, least. I'm sure that'll come up a few times. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I look forward to to hearing about it. But uh, I mean. Speaking of uh, wackos, you know, being what they aspire to be, you moved from Austin, Texas to Vermont, almost to the Canadian border, to start a pizza joint. I did. Um, That's bold. It's very bold. Uh, throughout my 20s, this was kind of my MO. I would just spend a few years building up 
a life in a decent level of comfort and making a decent amount of money, and then I would just flip a switch and blow it all up. So I kept re in, recreating myself every few years. Uh, when I moved to Austin in 2013, mm -hmm. I got a job at Whole Foods just as a cook, and then over the next several years, I got promoted several times. And eventually, I was an associate team leader, like running the prepared foods department. Um, and that was just the level of stress constantly, just constant input from every direction just grew to be a bit too much. I mean, I was helping manage a team of over 200, most of, wow. most of whom were either 19-year-olds or, you know, 80-year-old Mexican Cubans who weren't very interested in what I had to say. Sure. <laughs> well, it was more just like the, the general level of repeated upkeep of that department and just keep going, going, going. Uh, I myself come from a classical French uh, cooking background. I went to culinary school at the CIA, the yeah. Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Did the fine dining thing for a while. That's a pretty rough lifestyle as well. Yeah, I mean, I read Kitchen Confidential. Is that mm -hmm. I mean, is that a pretty accurate representation? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The uh, everything about that lifestyle is just it's it's funny. I mean, this goes back to when I first got to culinary school. After the first year or two, you realize that there are two types of people who go to culinary school. There are geeks like me who just like obsessed with food, watching Alton Brown throughout high school, who just really want to be somebody in that industry and express themselves through the art. And then there's all the people who are too stupid to get into a real college. <laughs> okay, got it. That's a pretty stark divide. It is. Okay. Uh, because culinary arts, just kitchen workers in general, I think this goes to a lot of the, uh, the trades. They're people who might have washed out of other things and maybe didn't aspire to much. And then they, they got a job as a cook or a woodworker or just like a day laborer. And then eventually you start to hone in, find your own aptitudes and your own abilities and just pick a direction mm -hmm. and slowly gain experience and move forward. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening with me now. You know, I haven't been in culinary school for 15 years now at this point. But, yeah. Yeah. So how long did you live in Austin? Uh, five years. Okay. So you came from New York to Austin. I was, I, I jumped around a little bit. Um, yeah. After school, I actually came to Austin to live for a year in 2009. Okay. And I did work at a fine dining restaurant called Fabian Rossi over on... Uh, Hearn Street by Deep Eddy, classical German with a German chef who was only two years older than me but acted like he was 65. <laughs> His name was Wolfgang and he spoke like this and he was very condescending and sardonic and you would never get anything from him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I can see I can see the character. Yeah, he, he let you know exactly who was boss in yeah. that place, as he yeah. should. Cause I, it, I'm half to remember my, my grandmother's German. She yeah. sounded very much like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was his place, right? Yeah. And so he, and he was a, a very young owner at the time. I think he was 27, 28, okay. owning his restaurant, younger than I am now. And he just had the balls to go for it. Yeah. So he and his wife ran that place. God bless. Yeah. And then after that, I moved to Portland, Maine, got a job as just making pizza, a place called Otto that my friend Tyler worked at. And then over the next two and a half, three years, we just built restaurants over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, Tyler is one of my best friends. He, he he and I grew up together, and he's my current business partner. Where'd you grow up? In northern Vermont, it's the same town actually. Oh. My restaurant is in. Oh, so they, that I was going to ask you, like that's a it, it's seemingly random, but yeah. it's not that random. It's no, it's not that random at all. Okay. I mean, I moved back because he he was still in Boston when I was in Austin. And he had a, he had just had a child who was about one at the time, and he just wanted to get his kid out of there. He didn't want his kid to grow up with traffic and just all the anger of living in the city. He's like, I want to move out to God's country, be surrounded by green. Mm -hmm. um, would you join me in this? Would wow. you be my partner? And wow. I, at the time, I was just, I was kind of at my wit's end at Whole Foods and my life in general here. And I just... Yeah. That was a big decision. That was about a year ago, right? A year and a half. year and a half. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how long was it between the time he asked you and the time you left? He asked me three separate times in three separate years. Okay. Like oh, le leading sure. up to the birth of his child and then a year after. And then I kept saying no because I love Austin. Yeah. Right? Uh, and I had a lot of promise here and I was in a relationship at the time. And then things just started coming together. Like... My girlfriend and I split up. I was living alone. I was just kind of taking on this grifter persona, kind of. <laughs> just trained jujitsu all the time, training yeah. atomic, going to, going to work, not doing much of anything else. Yeah. Nothing, nothing productive, really. 
And I started to be very critical of my path forward at Whole Foods. Okay. I could have kept going. I, I applied for a couple of promotions to be a, a team leader in a couple of different departments. Didn't get them. And I took that as a cosmic sign. I said, cool. Thank you for this. Yeah. Thank good. you for this direction. Sometimes you got to read the tea leaves of your own life, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I hate to sound all Jocko here, but he's like, you know, good. Good. Bad I, li- good. I like that video. It's like a three-minute video. I, and there's certainly been some really dark times in my life. When I've uh, played that, you know, a few times over. Yeah. It helps you out. So it, if, if it any does. of our listeners don't know, just Google uh, Jocko, J-O-C-K-O, and then the word good, and that should pop it up. <laughs> yeah. He's, it's what he's best known for. But yeah, yeah it, it's a great approach to life. Yeah. It's no a matter- philosophy, and basically the philosophy is that when, when faced with extraordinary <clears throat> difficulty and challenges, right, you just say good and figure out how you're going to turn that into the next thing. Yeah, because it, it forces you to... Uh, to think for yourself okay. and to be creative. Uh, there's a quote, I can't remember who it's by, but it says, man finds out who he is in moments of extremis. It might have been Gotha or something. Yep. And what that means is like, you only find out who you are and what you're prepared to deal with when it's confronted. When you're confronted with it, you have to jump left, jump right, mm-hmm. duck, jump over something, fight a bear in the woods. Yeah. Complacency and comfort are the enemies of that. Of growth. Of certainly. growth. Yeah. Mortally. That's just the way it is. Yeah. And I was entirely too comfortable with my lifestyle. Yeah. And like, as is the problem in Austin, after several years, I was, I was in my early 30s, and there was just this perpetual juvenilia in this town, I think, because everyone, I think, is a server or a bartender, mm-hmm. and then they, they get that job in the earlier mid-20s, and then they find they can make real money at it, and then 10 years later, you're still doing the same thing. And I just felt that I needed to blow things up and just start from scratch and recreate. So now, is that something that you've seen in your life over and over? So uh, I guess we'll get to what you're doing in Vermont in a minute. But, I mean, what's going to happen when you get comfortable with uh, Vermont? Um, move to Sweden? Yeah, there you I, go. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a bunch of pipe dreams. Okay. Myself. We'll get to, I, I, w- I would love to hear about your pipe dreams. <laughs> but I, I, I'm fascinated um, <clears throat> by your idea of opening a restaurant because... Uh, and I also do want to tell you, you mentioned jujitsu for a little bit. I do want to chat about that. But uh, restaurants are notoriously challenging businesses, right? And you have, uh, even if you, for me, uh, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential was an eye-opening book. Actually. And I had, uh, you know, Britton Morris, the coach at Atomic. Yes. I had his mom, Andrea Morris, on the, on the show a few weeks ago. And she just opened a food truck, right? And we talked about, uh, one of the things that Anthony Bourdain talks about in his book is... Uh, this the the kind of breed of restaurant that is, uh, in his opinion, doomed to fail, which is the kind of dentist and his wife that love to, mm-hmm. or, or dentist and her husband, who love to cook and love to have dinner parties, and all their friends say, my gosh, you know, uh, Jessica and Tom, you should really open up your own restaurant, and yeah. then they take all their savings from their dentist practice, and they go do that. Yeah. And those tend to not do so well so why go open a restaurant and what are they i mean uh, i god there's so there's probably so much here but uh it's how do you how do you deal with a, a, a business that's so difficult and, and why do this well a little bit of context here so you yeah. hear these these numbers i don't yeah. know how true they are but just throwing out into the ether like you know Three out of four restaurants fail in their first year, 90% within their first five years, but da da I think a lot of those numbers are probably pretty close to correct. Mm-hmm. But I think that that average is skewed by the kind of scenario you were just talking about mm-hmm. of people who they want to be chefs. They want to have their own place because food is sexy, right? Mm-hmm. It's romantic. You get to you know make something, craft something with your own hands, slice the garlic yourself, source everything locally, Serve it to people on their on Valentine's Day, make their night. Everything about it is beautiful, but the grind that goes into running a business like that—it's rough, man. Yeah, it's it's rich, thin right? margins. Yeah, crazy personalities. Yeah, because automatically you're always dealing with just crazy personalities because we're talking about cook. They're all misfits and pirates on some level. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. I know that that's a big thing for you. What what makes uh, you know? what kind of personalities do you end up with in the kitchen and yeah. what what are some of the issues that you run across there? As I said before, and I, I don't want to... I'm Actually, I am okay with generalizing because I'm one of these people. <laughs> um, typically, you're, you're at liberty to do that. Yeah, typically in a kitchen, you 
the people who end up there were because they washed out of another industry or because they never really had any real direction in one way or another. Yeah. Like that, that was kind of what happened to me. I, I wasn't groomed to be anything. My parents like just kind of dropped me into a sandbox and said, find your own way. Mm-hmm. Like with guidance and support, of course, but like they never pushed me to be one thing or another. My mom said being a speech pathologist would be a good paying job. But besides that, it never, nothing ever came of it, right? Yeah. So you get these very rugged, tired, scarred individual individuals, right, who just they're used to kind of forging their own path, grinding from job to job. Um, and then there's kind of a weight to working in the industry, mm-hmm. right, which happens a lot with cooks, especially in fine dining or like, you know, huge production kitchens where – it's all, everything is a rite of passage and everything hurts. The knives hurt, the fire hurts, deep cleaning a fryer hurts. You do these things and you hate them while you're doing them and then you love the experience afterward. Mm. You own it. Sounds like climbing a mountain. Exactly, yeah. Nothing's fun when you're doing it. No. And then it's a rite of passage too and as younger, newer, fresher, more innocent faces come into the kitchen, you make them do the same thing because it <laughs> hardens you. Yep. you. You get tempered, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like jujitsu. Yeah, way. exactly. It's it's like any of those really rough trades, right? Like if I were to become a welder tomorrow, yeah, I'd have to go through some shit sure. and burn myself a lot and inhale a lot of you know, yeah, a lot of fumes to to be able to to prove my worth and prove that I'm worth a shit. Yep, and stack stack a lot of dimes and everything. Yep. Um, but the same thing happens in kitchens, right? So there's. There's a level of confrontation. The median level of confrontation is much higher in kitchens because everyone relies on each other. You're a, you're a platoon on some level. In fact, even the, the old French approach to managing a kitchen is very military-based. Augustus Escoffier, this legendary French chef, came up with something called the brigade system where everyone has their purpose, everyone has their station, and you all rely on each other to pull it off. One guy does grill, one guy does proteins, one guy does sauces, a saucier. One guy takes care of just like salads and garnishes and everything. And one guy's an expo, just this, this drill sergeant running everything, running everything in the kitchen. If one link is bad there, it goes bad very quickly. So there's this interdependence of everybody there. And so even small, almost imperceivable slights can escalate to something pretty quickly. Tell me, tell me some stories. What have you seen happen? Oh, Jesus Christ. It, a lot of it happened. It, when I was at Fabian Rossi, I, there was, it was a very small crew. There was myself and Wolfgang, the chef, and then we had Diego, who's the dishwasher slash salad boy, mm-hmm. and Maria, his sister, who did, did odds and ends, and I was responsible for 80% of the prep list because I was the sous chef. And one night, I kind of spaced on making like a, a garlic compound butter. I thought I'd be fine with the amount I had. And I wasn't because we just got slaughtered on Thursday, mm-hmm. like Friday numbers on Thursday. And Wolfgang found out real quick that I had run out of this thing and I was just dressed down and about like, a simple little thing. Like I didn't <clears throat> produce enough garlic butter mm. on any other Thursday. It would have been enough, but it wasn't on that night. And what happened? Oh, I just got, he took me into the walk and screamed at me. And like, if he had had a cleaver in his hand, I'm sure it would have been wedged into my forehead, but that's the old European way. And he yeah. came up. He was, like I said, he was a few years older than me. He came up, you know, training in German kitchens and like resort castles with people who lived behind the Iron Curtain for, for decades. Yeah. It's a very different world. Yeah. And they make it very clear, the French and German chefs, when they come over to this side of the pond, that, listen, this is the way this industry has to be executed and carried out. Mm-hmm. And no... Um, American sympathies or, or anything are going to be tolerated. And they, they burn that right out of you very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? How do you process that? So in the sense of do you then internalize that as the way things are and then you run your kitchen the same way? At first, uh, absolutely. Okay. When I was, I was 23 or 24 at the time, and... That was just what was ingrained into me, and that's how I, I aspired to carry things out. Uh, mm-hmm. As I've matured throughout my career, especially at Whole Foods, I kind of started to give that stuff up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that was because at Whole Foods, like it's a huge corporate conglomerate. I deal with some very sensitive types there, and I have HR looking over my shoulder about every little thing I do. Sure. 
Yeah, every you can't talk to someone alone. There always has to be a third person in the room. You can't talk to them certain hours of the day. It has to be a certain time of their shift. You can't use certain buzzwords that are going to offend people. Hmm. The, the whole concept of triggering was really focused on. And somewhere between those two extremes, the truth lies, right? Because I want to be a good leader who holds people accountable and make sure that they, they're doing what they should be doing, yeah. and that their head's down and they're working. At the same time, I don't just want to be an asshole who's yelling for the sake of yelling. Right. And I worked for that guy several times. Yep. Same guy over and over again. That's just that kind of anger, that kind of vitriol just coming out of your pores, it doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. It really doesn't. And the, my current gig at the restaurant, that's just not how I want to run the kitchen. It's not. Okay. Hey, I will take a quick break here to talk about our sponsor, Gusto. That's G-U-S-T-O. And Gusto is a company that helps you run your payroll, your benefits, your HR. And uh, you can uh, do things like uh, run everybody's payroll, including their W-2s and 1099s. I mean, these things are a pain. Uh, you know, I've, I've run a business. I know exactly what it means to have to do all that. And you have all these distractions that keep you away from focusing on the things that you want to focus on as a small business and the things that we talk about in this podcast that help you be successful. So this is uh, one that, this is one of the things that you have to do well, but it's uh, at the same time uh, tedious. So there are companies that help you do that. And Gusto is a very good one. So go to gusto.com, G-U-S-T-O.com slash war stories, and you can get three free months once you run your first payroll. And we'll get back to Silas right now. So help me understand how mental health fits into all this. So you and I have had some talks before uh, about, uh, about mental health and about um, how Really, in, in your words, a lot of people, in, uh, th that it's, a, it's an issue in your industry, yeah. right? So how do you fit all of this in there? I mean, how do you, um, I mean, you've, I can't describe it the way you, you have, so I'll let, I'll let you talk about it, but you talk about how this is an industry that seems to attract this. Yeah, because you attract the pirates and the misfits and the marauders, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, whether it's, you know, daddy issues or just this perpetual existential dread around you um do you have that yeah, absolutely i was born with it okay i'm from northern new england we all have existential dreams <laughs> there's there's this weight to growing up there yeah. i mean maybe it's this this old religious guilt thing or maybe it's just see like lingering colonialism and all the violence that went into you know settling that part of the country or maybe it's just because it's so goddamn cold mm -hmm. six months out of the year mm -hmm. then like a lot of the humanity it just gets just evaporates <laughs> right but having an awareness of these issues is a huge step in itself because um, you get people who they'll be a line cook or a bartender or a server the better part of their entire lives mm -hmm. Bourdain himself spoke about ad nauseum he said he was like a 45 year old line cook with no hope in the world prepping for brunch and then he he wrote a piece for the New York Times or New York Magazine about just about life in a kitchen. And then based on the strength of that, he wrote Kitchen Confidential, and then straight to the stratosphere from there. He became the guy that we all knew and loved. Um, when you're in a kitchen like that, and you're working these 16, 18 hour days, yeah. completely thankless days, all that negativity in your mind, whether you're cognizant of it or not, it just festers and grows slowly, and like some Lovecraftian horror just seeps its tendrils into you. And eventually you get defined by these things. Now, mm -hmm. there are a couple things that really exacerbate this. Drinking culture. I say as I drink a beer with you. Yeah. Um, well, I think yeah. a, you know, Stella, which is what we're drinking right now, <laughs> light beer, is a little bit different than what you're talking about, right? Oh, it is. But if you think you, you get to work at 11 or noon, you prep all afternoon, you get walloped during service, you get out around 11, 30, 12 at night, you guys are going to the bar. There's nothing else going on. There's nothing else open. So drinking and using alcohol as a crutch becomes just a rite of, first a rite of passage, and then just it becomes Monday night. Yep. Um, 
and it's even I mean, there's an entire there's, there's something called service industry night which yeah. is a lot of bars actually mm-hmm. like host people who come drink absolutely as they should because it's an appreciation for the people who really slave away behind the scenes mm-hmm. but there's a there's a dark shadow cast by that right and it's even built into the the system itself mm-hmm. into the kitchen system you a lot of places you get a shift beer and it's kind of uses like a carrot on the stick if you guys fucked up no shift beers tonight Silas, if you did extra good tonight, you get the expensive beer. There's this carrot on the stick in front of you, and you're... Maybe you don't even care about the expensive beer itself. You just like the recognition from Chef, yeah. right? Do you use that? No. Well, mo- <laughs> most of my staff is 17. Okay. So I can't, I can't <laughs> use that right now. I have an army of high schoolers who works for me. It's awesome. There, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I, that allows me to ignore a lot of the, the pitfalls that would usually happen to someone yeah. in my position. But... Like I said, these everyone in the kitchen just carries a weight on their shoulders, and they self-medicate a lot. And it's not just the downers like alcohol to, to put yourself to sleep. It's also, you know, you go home, you work two doubles in a row, you get four hours of sleep, you're going to need an upper. And coffee's not the only upper out there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the use of cocaine or now Adderall or any number of things to keep yourself awake and just awake or in aware of your world going forward – so you're kind of living life guardrail to guardrail mm-hmm. where you're like kind of going up or down or... Yeah. You're just ping-ponging back and forth. Yeah. And there's there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? You can't just get all the benefits and none of the none of the drawbacks from any of these things. So they, they stack on you. And you age a lot. You do. And I think the isolation of working that kind of job with that kind of hours, maybe not seeing your, your family, not seeing your friends... I myself, I lost a relationship because of the opening of this restaurant. And this is still pretty fresh. This is just uh, five, six months ago. So you had a girlfriend in Vermont. Yeah. She moved up here, or up there from Texas to, to be with me. Right? And I built out the restaurant and I opened up in mid-November. And we were so popular, so stupid popular the first month and a half, I never left that place. Mm-hmm. Which is great for the bottom line. Not that the bottom line means anything right now because we're just crawling our way back up to level, right? But, you know, you just, you isolate people. And it wasn't just my physical absence. It's just because I was so emotionally checked out at the end of the day. Yeah. You just didn't have time for anything else. I didn't have time for anything else. And I just pushed everything away. Mm. And she was the biggest recipient of that. And to her credit, she's a very strong woman. She let me know that a couple times and eventually said, yeah, I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah. That must have been challenging for you. It was very challenging. It, she was totally on the right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy it happened in some ways because it helped me just clear the slate and move forward. And, you know, she probably has better things going on now. And she didn't need me constantly being around. Yeah. Is there an answer to this? Or is this just you got to, you know, uh, in the worlds of uh, Bukowski, you know, find when you love and let it kill you? <laughs> oh, it's funny you, you brought that up because on my day off, at the German restaurant, there was a brunch, uh, and I used to go in on my day off to eat brunch, and I would read Bukowski, because mm-hmm. uh, it was so silly. So like now, I'm 33. I was 23, and I just wanted to be this old, haggard grifter, mm-hmm. this, you know, like, boozing, womanizing, like, just, yeah, uh, vagabond moving from state to state. And Tom Waits probably didn't help very much. <laughs> because that's like why I was I'm into still, it. I'm looking at that record. That's so awesome. But okay, let's continue. So, I just, I kind of, it, this is a term I've started using recently. I don't think I have a very addictive personality. I'm not very nat- addictive. Okay. Yeah. I'm not naturally drawn to anything. I don't, I'm not drawn to alcohol. I'm not drawn to cocaine. I'm not drawn to any of these things. But working in a high stress situation like that in kitchens where everything is, these vices are surrounding you all the time. It makes you self-actualize your alcoholism. If you don't have a problem, you will design yourself a problem and you will build it and flesh it out for yourself and then it will eventually consume you. And that's kind of what started to happen to me. Because I just designed my life around this lifestyle and then slowly just started to creep in and eat away at me. Um, And I think it's happened to a lot of people. And just because we're all kind of misfits, we all have some mental issues anyway, which just get magnified by this through this prism of alcohol and long hours and quick turnarounds. Yeah. And that's another thing I'd like to you know make a major point 
in this conversation with you is that this is all, I'm speaking about myself personally, this is all while having pretty crushing depression my entire life, mm-hmm. as far as I can remember. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about, shit's about to get real. I'm just going to sure. throw that out there. No, no, I'm, I'm listening. Um, a lot of the reason I chose this industry is because I got to just define my own success in some ways, mm-hmm. or at the very least, you know, have a very personalized lifestyle and present it to chef. And if he approved, great. And I would just be the biggest badass in the kitchen. You, you serve everyone but yourself, right? And for me, it was just because I had, you know, serious social isolation issues, serious depression issues. There was just this gloom that surrounded me. And it was, you could chase it away and keep it at bay working these types of hours. Because when you work 18 hours a day, you don't have time to think about much else. Mm -hmm. But eventually they really catch up with you, right? And this was a big part of the reason I started to, oh, why I decided to blow everything up and move up to Vermont. Because I was working this corporate lifestyle that I had to hire and hire people I didn't want, didn't like, and fire people I did like, and answer to my boss's 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 boss, and this all just exacerbated my my inherent depression, right? So I thought it'd be good for me to just blow everything up and come up with a way out of that, out of that lifestyle, to climb out of the pit. So I started to install different safeguards in my life. Because I was very aware of this, these issues that I had mentally. And that's a huge deal, right? I think uh, one of my favorite sayings is the name of the game is awareness, not perfection. So if you're, you know, even the fact that you, you can see that uh, and, and even further talk about it, that's like miles above a lot of folks who deal with this kind of. It is, issue. especially from, for someone from northern New England where these things are kind of verboten. You don't talk about these things. Yeah. You just you bury so there's, them. You have this combination of existential dread, you know, the depression, the weather, the ether that you live in, and the great irony, or perhaps not irony, of the fact that you don't talk about that. Yeah, exactly. So it, it it's just a pressure cooker. It just burns away at you. Yeah. And whenever anyone brings it up, you just you just change the subject. You move on. You don't allow anyone to know you. And this is what isolated my former romantic partners and, and friends. And Do you talk to your romantic partners about this? Like the people close to you? I started to a bit. It's funny because I've always had these issues, but I think it wasn't until I was about 30 till I could actually admit it. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just tired. I'm fine. I'm just tired. There's lots of that. I'm fine. I'm just hungover. Yeah. Um, over the past year, it's, it's started to come much more to the forefront, where I can speak candidly about these things, which at one time were just kind of embarrassing. And Yeah, no, this is really brave. I mean, I think uh, I've, I've been on uh, actually a jiu-jitsu podcast talking about, uh, as a guest, not as a host, um, talking about um, mental health and entrepreneurship as somebody who started a company for 10 years. <clears throat> and there's a lot of that, you know, similar patterns yeah. and, and similar isolation that you're talking about. So I, I can very much relate to what you're saying. But this gives, brings me to entrepreneurship and just lofty goals in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I l- laid out for myself is that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to leave my decent paying job and move up to the unknown in my hometown, which is depressing in itself, right? If I'm going to do all these things, I need to make sure I have very lofty goals and I hold myself accountable because I'm, I'm worth that at least, right? Mm-hmm. I may not be worth much, but I'm worth holding myself to my word. Yep. So I said, I'm going to open the, I'm going to come up with a menu by such and such a date. And this was for a non-existent restaurant at the time, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to come up with a business plan by such and such a date. And luckily I had a a business partner and his fiance who were, you know, more than willing to put in all this work, much more work than than me in some of these areas, like finding funding. And I'm going to make sure that every once in a while I sit down, I look at my whole life, I take stock of everything, and I hold myself accountable. I started writing a cookbook in my, as a side project. I gave myself three years. And we're a year and two months into that right now. So I have to get back going on that, right? I ultimately decided that giving myself these responsibilities yeah. and these, these perpetual everyday responsibilities, that was what was going to keep me alive. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise things could have gone much darker if I was still just living day to day. Let me ask you a question. So I can relate to a lot of the stuff you're saying. 
I also have, um, I would say one of my cardinal flaws is I have too many ideas and too many projects and too many things that I do. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, I, that I've kind of come to realize in my life is, uh, I mean, to what, to what level, I mean, when, when, when are you good enough? Like, when is it enough? And not only when are you good enough, but when when do some of these like perpetual busyness and like when does that became a f- when does that become rather ESL sorry a form of escapism from actually sitting with the moment? For me, like I, I kind of aspire to be like the the Greek or Roman version of a of a successful human being, mm-hmm. where you're you're a warrior a warrior in your youth. Then you become a statesman, eventually become a wise elder. What that means to me is that, like, eventually, if you diversify your interests enough, and they're they're on different ends of the spectrum enough, it, it's not as much working yourself to death because I take my restaurant and jujitsu very seriously. Yeah. And I take, you're a fearsome fighter. You're yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. As somebody who has grappled you. Not not fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got handled just a couple hours ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I start adding new new interests and new coping techniques to my life. Like foraging mushrooms is a huge one for me. And luckily yeah. I live at a latitude where they're everywhere. So I can go out and find dinner. And different types of dinner. And some dinner can kill me and some can't. Like all mushrooms are edible, but some are only edible once, right? <laughs> and that's, that's really exciting to me because life should be dangerous like that, right? And then like... So I do that, and I have different fermentation projects going all over my house. And I've, I was not raised to be a craftsman, but in building the restaurant, I said, cool, I get to learn how to be a carpenter, and I get to learn how to lay vinyl planking floors, and I get to learn you know, rudimentary plumbing and electrical techniques. That's all so exciting for me. Mm-hmm. And my, my spare time, Vice now, which is not even a Vice, I just watch blacksmithing videos. So I'm going to be building myself a forge when I get back <clears throat> and just doing that in my spare time. So tell me more about that. What is that? Blacksmithing. Oh, video? blacksmithing. Yeah. yeah, I took one blacksmithing class. Uh, it's uh, yeah, that's that's intense stuff. It, it's just so much fun about like just taking a raw material yeah. and just molding it to what you want yeah, to be. I have which a is punch up there somewhere that I made. A yeah. sand punch. Yeah, it's great. It's yeah. it's like it's. I guess it's some weird, silly, contrived allegory for my life. Really, I take the raw piece of material I am and slowly just morph it and redistribute material mm. into something I'd 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 want to be. Yeah. And, and the process of doing that is by making it really hot. Yeah, exactly. And like, and also it, you deal with metal and fire and forging, which like my entire industry is based on metal and fire and yeah. and just taking something and turning it into something better, yeah. something more presentable. So all of this just ties into, you know, just be who, be someone, aspire to be someone that you would respect. And I didn't really have much respect for myself for a long time. And now I think I'm finally on a path forward. And the issues I have mentally, they're not gone. Yeah. By the way, the, these issues, quote unquote, you talk about, I mean, they're way more common than people admit to. Right? They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. And I think there's a, I, I think that's just kind of a byproduct of the modern human condition because we're, in, we're entirely too comfortable yeah. a lot of the time. Like we have air conditioning and we're, we're in a house protected from the, the ants and the bears and the bees. And we don't have to fight to survive at all. And I think just idle time just leads to these demon seeds being placed in your head, and then they slowly blossom and turn to something much darker. And then, oh, just awareness of that is a big deal. Mm-hmm. And then, do you meditate at all? Yes, I do. Okay, yeah, I, I, that's been a huge deal for me. Yeah, it, me as well. And I got out of it for several years, and now I'm taking it much more seriously. And I wake up, and I, I live alone, and I do you know, a half hour of yoga every morning, mostly because my joints are falling apart because I've been grappling <laughs> for 12 years. But that acts in itself; it's a meditation. Yeah. Right, and I have a couple of other types of meditation. Going into the woods is a meditation too. And eventually, what happened to me, and I'm sure it happens to a lot of other people, is after I made the leap and I started to acknowledge all these issues that I had mentally, I started to feel even worse because of how silly some of them were. Like I'm just I'm mopey. I don't know why. I don't have any reason to be mopey. I have a successful business. I have parents who love me. I have a staff who I think likes me. I have a business partner who I love dearly, and I, we hang out on our day off. Mm-hmm. We get along great. And there's, um, 
Even if they're silly, though, they don't go away. I mean, there, there's a Neil Young quote from the song on the beach. was like, though my problems are meaningless, I don't make them go away. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, everyone has problems. Some of them seem very, very bad. Yeah. And even though they're silly, it doesn't make them go away. So you find these coping mechanisms. And for me, it's being out in nature and dealing with fire and getting through a great busy Friday service and just seeing people happy yeah. at my place and yeah. enjoying what I do, what my staff does, what my, my partner and I have presented. Like we have this little oasis in the middle of the country that's like there isn't a whole lot going on there food-wise besides a really good diner and a couple of grocery stores, or I mean a couple of convenience stores. Mm-hmm. And now we have a place you can go get a beer, a glass of really fun, funky wine, have a pizza that's completely scratch-made, Meet your Tinder date there. We're the Tinder spot now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How many people live in the town where you have this? <clears throat> About 4,000 right now. Wow. It's a bedroom community for, for the next county over. Okay. Um, Tinder must be interesting. Like dating apps in a town of 4,000 people. <clears throat> well, I, I found out all this secondhand because that's never really been my thing, and I'm, I don't engage in it. But I love this morbid curiosity <clears throat> of like whatever else is up to. Yeah. We'll be behind the line just watching this really awkward couple have a really awkward date at table two. I'm like, what's going on over there? <laughs> and that's just a game that we get to play. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, it helps to enrich the daily experience, too. That's cool. No, I, I, think, I think a lot of what you're talking about is, like, it, it is, it's powerful. It's powerful for you to, like, admit this and talk, talk about it and, and own it. I mean, I've, it's certainly been uh, a lot of stuff you're saying is, you know, very relatable to me. And I think it's very relatable to uh, a lot of people, but like you said, it's not just in New England that it's not okay to yeah. talk about. You know? Yeah, and it's it's everywhere, and I think traditionally in our culture, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little hoarse right now. No, it's fine. The um, it's considered a sign of weakness, not even just to have it, but to admit it. Definitely, that's a huge sign of weakness. Yeah, you're showing a crack in your armor, and it just ultimately makes us these very emotionally unavailable cyborgs who just live to work and I was definitely one of those and I am in a lot of ways it takes constant work yeah to get myself yeah the work's never done we had a great uh, conversation with Todd Moore a atomic mm-hmm. athlete about that about his dad uh, telling him that you know they, they were laying down stones and they, they, I think his dad lives in Phoenix I want to say somewhere really hot in Arizona and uh, they were like done laying st- and like they Todd was helping them lay stones and uh, they got done particularly early let's say they got done at 11 a.m. something that they thought was going to take until five yeah and then todd went up to his dad and said okay we're done now and his dad's like no 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 now we got that other you know (laughs) like wall we got to put up there and he's like son the work never ends there's always something to do yeah and i think i think that's true also of this whole work with uh with awareness with mental health it is yeah the same in the kitchen there's always something to do there's always something to cut yeah something to pickle something to restock something to clean is the big one there's always something to clean and your outlets for, for dealing with this, so you have Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. which, uh, uh, again, I cannot overemphasize uh, how, how good you are at that. Um, you know, Thank you. I probably outweigh you by a solid 30, 40 pounds, and you absolutely mopped the mat with me and with many other folks uh, in, in mushroom foraging, right? So yeah. what, what is it about these activities that, that allow you to have that, that, why do you seek them as an outlet? I hadn't tried to draw a parallel between those two before, but just off the top of my head, they, they give me a sense of my body and my, my space in the larger world. When you fight someone, too, you, you roll with someone for, that's our term for, for sparring jiu-jitsu, of course. When you roll with someone for five minutes, you learn more about them than you do in an hour of conversation. Mm-hmm. And you get to use your body as a weapon and hone it and condition it and f- fire harden it and anneal it and just sharpen it and do all these different things to make yourself more dangerous and more able and a more respectable, dangerous, hard to kill human being to, yeah. you know, quote our friend Todd. And I love that about the sport. It's, it's a, you have to fight to survive. It gives you a semblance of what we're supposed to be doing is fighting to survive. Mm-hmm. And it gives you a little slice of that, that lineage we have as, as primates really as animals Mm -hmm. and when i'm out in the woods i'm alone i get to just close my eyes and listen to everything around me listen to the cicadas and the and the squirrels and the bees 
and I'll see a deer every once in a while, or I'll find like you know bear tracks, and that's really exciting. And I feel like I'm a smaller part of a much larger world, mm-hmm. and it makes me feel a little more in in place, right? Yeah, it's a connection. Yeah, it's good to feel small sometimes too. Yeah, you can feel big as the boss in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. That's not the kind of mindset you should get used to. Yeah. yeah no, this, I love. I mean, I uh, that's why you know I crossed the Grand Canyon on foot last year, yeah. and there's you feel very very small there. And I, I think it's, uh, yeah, getting away from the constant, you know, red bubble on your texts and, and, and it's kind of being, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like a lot of ideas do come, come up and, you know, bubble up to the surface in those. Well, they do. And like, it, once you get rid of the noise, yeah. when you don't, haven't seen a car and you don't have your phone on you, yeah. things just make more sense. There's also ways that I've been trying to incorporate this into my work. So uh, this is an idea that I got from a podcast guest. I get a lot of ideas from podcasts. Like, uh, Jester, uh, uh, Jester King, founder, uh, mm-hmm. Jeffrey Stuffings. He was on the show talking about how he, if he has a really difficult problem to grapple with, he uh, puts a timer and gets a cup of coffee in the morning and then literally just writes a prompt at the uh, top of the page and then sets a timer for 45 minutes, no phone, no anything. And then just writes. Yeah. And then he says an unusually high, I forget the exact uh, percentage of times, he ends up coming up with like meaningful solutions to things that he's dealing with. I think just the act of creation yeah. helps. It, it helps. Like me writing a menu is therapeutic. I mean, deciding what color to paint a wall when I'm building my restaurant, that's therapeutic. Yeah. You know, I'm sure when you're building a guitar or writing a new song, it, there's something about focusing that energy inside you into something, mm-hmm. even if it's not tactile. Yep. Even if it's just an idea or a sound, that helps helps like focus all this energy yeah. and turns it keeps it from turning into negative energy. And that's the, my overarching theme here is that preaching to people who may not have the confidence yet to move forward with their ideas, may not even know that they're allowed to have ideas. First, realize who you are, what you're supposed to be. And it's going to take you a while. It took me until my late 20s to really figure out who I was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm on my way now, but I'm not there. I'm getting there. I don't think we're I don't think we're ever done with that. No, we're never done. But like you can at least you know kind of find a path forward, sure. right? Um, and maybe use the act of entrepreneurship to do something good for yourself and redefine who you're supposed to be, and use it to kind of make up for some of your shortcomings. Like me opening the restaurant, giving myself this gigantic responsibility. Mm-hmm. It was part of dealing with my own issues. And moving forward in my career and giving myself ownership over something. These are my ideas that are on a menu that are being written about in the paper. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, it's really cool. And if you're sitting there kind of unsure of where you are in life and which direction you're going and you've been working the same office job for 10 years, yeah. what can you do that's special? What can you do that differentiates you from the other people around you? It's easier than ever to, to create a... Uh, a brand for yourself. Sure. I hate the term brand, but like still, you can treat yourself as a brand. Like, do you have an idea? Do you have a service you can offer people? Can you start a side business that eventually blossoms and grows into a, a real business? Can you open an Etsy shop with those little crochets, crocheting that you do? Can you, you know, forge mushrooms for someone and sell it to a local store? Can you make a knife for someone in your backyard and then sell that on online or to your neighbors? What can you do to continually improve yourself and redefine who you are and where you're going? Mm-hmm. And this is something that's really come to the forefront for me with opening the restaurant and giving, finding worth for myself. And it's hard. Sometimes I, I suffer from imposter syndrome a lot. Mm-hmm. I have a very successful restaurant, much more successful than we thought it was going to be. And then five or six weeks into the, into the opening, I was like, I still feel exactly the same as I did before. Mm-hmm. I still, yeah. And it made it worse. It made things darker. And that was around the time I lost my relationship, too. And it, it, all that humbling happened, and then it made things much better mm-hmm. because it helped me just clear the floor and just find purpose and reset goals for myself and know that I had, the, in the restaurant, I had this tremendous opportunity to express myself, to challenge myself, to teach and coach people who are younger than I am about the ways of the kitchen and the ways of the world in general. And if I could have beers with these people after a shift, I would. But again, they're all 17 and mm-hmm. most of them are high schoolers. But I have an army of high schoolers, which is awesome <laughs> in itself, right? That's awesome. Earlier on, you were talking about some of the uh, crazy ideas that you have. And, you know, not for today, but for down the line. What are some of those? Well, 
for me, we have a, a pretty straightforward restaurant right now. 24 seats, six seats at the bar. There's a nice little stone coffee table of a stone you just found somewhere. It's like a 300 pound piece of like slate kind of. Wow. So I think we, we really set up a shop that has a very striking aesthetic. It's very us, me and Tyler and Allie, who are the, um, Tyler's the other owner and Allie's his fiance, who's a huge part of the, the operation. <coughs> Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> but we're very limited by the space in some ways. And although we told ourselves we would not seek to expand immediately, which we could based on the strength of our name already, we'll give ourselves a year, maybe two, and then open another spot. And we were thinking, how can we differentiate this and do something cool and do something different? I've always been in love with Jester King, right? They have this little like farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere with just picnic tables and people are out there just playing hacky sack or yep. throwing horseshoes or something. And then they have that cool little pizza in the, in the fire engine thing. I would love to, have, love to have a spot like that. Yeah. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, all of us are very into performance, all different kinds of performance. And it's not just like, you know, gloomy, angry music like Nick Cave. For me, it's also like, I like weird cabaret and folk and all these things. And then Ty and Allie are the same way. So we would love to open a performance spot at some point. I'd love to come and play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when we get open, you'll be the first to know. There you go. Uh, and then because not just to, you know, curate our own thoughts and our own loves into something, but to. Well, you should do that. Well, it will be that, but also it gives me a chance to share things with people. Yeah. The same way I share weird ingredients on my menu. Yeah. I have a whole pickle What's program. What's the weirdest thing now? Well, I have a, a Korean barbecue pizza called the Nomad, and it has house-made kimchi on it. Wow. Yeah, and it's okay. awesome. And it, it, it's some a lot of people, it's their favorite thing in the world. And it's one of my favorite things in the world, too, because I get to make oh, <laughs> three-gallon yeah. batches of kimchi every two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to explain to a lot of people what kimchi is, and I am happy to do that because it's, you know, to a lot of people, it's, it's kind of this weird swerve. I'm like, this, this awesome thing, like the Koreans figured out lacto-fermented things yeah. better than anyone else, and this is, this is how... Yeah, I love, I have kimchi and sauerkraut yeah. in the fridge. I mean, it's, uh... Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, it's garlicky, spicy sauerkraut. Yeah. Ch chemically, they're exactly the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, and I get to show this, open this new door to someone. And maybe get them sprout an interest and plant an interest into their head, and then yeah. they can just go with that on their own. That's awesome. Yeah, and I got to you know feature all these weird local mushrooms I get from a, a grower the town over, or maybe I can forage my own and explain to people, hey, this is what's going on with this. This is what's going on with this. I have a a beverage program with like local beer in Vermont. It's awesome. It's all way too strong, but it's awesome. <clears throat> And there's some really cool wine and ciders going on there too. Yeah. And I can explain to people like, this is what weirdos off in the hills are doing. And I'm going to present their craft to you so you can know what they're, what they're and this so is. You're this, a messenger in a lot of yeah. ways. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I speak and stump for these people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's, it's really cool. Like a cool side or, or a side to what I, I got to do is I get to focus on and present other people's work and curate the awesome things other people are doing that I'm not doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's and awesome. that's, it's, it's just become a, a major part of the business. That's great. I mean, that's good to find that, um, that identity, right? And that's something that, that makes you, you know, a messenger through food, through, through yeah. all these. What is the number one lesson that you've learned as a small business owner that you want to share with our audience? A lot of them are either small business owners or people who are thinking about starting a small business. Leading up to your own small business, identify what you're good at. What can you do? differentiate yourself from everyone else what can you do that really like exemplifies your personality and your your journey really put all these things down on paper physically on paper don't even write down on a laptop just write and there's something about physically writing something right that just lays it out and puts it actually into the universe and then just look at it and then just start to draw a bunch of porcupine lines off around the side and see how you can come up with different ideas that sprout off of that of like, how could you make a business out of it? How can you express yourself and how can you make money doing so? How can you be financially responsible in how you carry this out? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a little side project, even if it's, you know, selling things on Etsy. Yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm a cat person, I enjoy it. What's that? I'm a cat person, I enjoy it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then... We have a cat seeking attention here. That's right. <laughs> then once you do all that, take the plunge. You're worth it. People are worth it. We all have ideas, and sometimes our bosses don't want us to know that. And it's That's just interesting. What do you mean by that? So people, 
So yeah, a lot of times bosses don't have an interest in people finding yeah. out their own path because then they're going to leave. No, they don't. I mean, I, I celebrate a lot of about a lot of the tenets of American capitalism and how it encourages entrepreneurship and encourages you to go do you and make your own forge your own future. But at the same time, once you get like involved in a big corporate conglomerate, you're just another statistic, which I was at Whole Foods, and I have no interest in being that again. Yeah. Right. And I was, I was in a position where I actually could be <coughs> kind of creative just because I, given the nature of food and the way we organize things and like the position I was in, you know, I could do that, but not everyone can, yeah. right? And if you, if you feel that you're stuck and that you're stagnant or even worse that you're just complacent in life, do something different, right? Mix it up, have a backup plan, have a bunch of them. Don't, you know, forfeit your, your life savings on on this really harebrained venture and make sure your family's okay. But be creative and find a way to give yourself a more self-actualized life. Because life's too short. You only have one of them, right? And it goes away pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Like I very vividly remember being 15, mm -hmm. not that long ago. And now I'm 33. And before I know it, I'm gonna be 40. And that's a big part of why I chose to open the restaurant this past year, like. Yeah. I'm not old, but I'm old enough where if I don't act and do things now for me, yeah. eventually they'll just evaporate and they'll slip away. That's and I, I don't want to be that guy. And neither should anyone. I mm -hmm. love that. I love that. Where can people find you? If people are interested in learning more about you and about your business, where can people find you? Uh, Stonesthrowpizzavt.com is our main website. Uh, Stones Throw Pizza on Facebook and Stones Throw vt on instagram mm -hmm. my instagram is troubles braids which is just it's a tom Waits song so it's just one yeah. word troubles braids uh it's essentially just me looking for mushrooms pickling things playing loud depressing music hanging out with my cat sounds good that's just who i've become and it's i'm just owning it now at this point right mr silas paul you've been an amazing guest thank you thank so you, much for sharing your story and uh yeah look forward to uh having you in the show again soon thank you for having this show and it putting a, a spotlight on people who have ideas and create and just want to do something. It's, it's really cool. I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Small business war stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. <laughs>